All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Friday Ramblings. We are here to discuss all the greatest that is entertainment. Give me a little hints of things that you might want to get closer looks at in order to make your world more entertaining. This week we're going to discuss a classic film series that is a personal favorite of mine, and that is the Crocodile Dundee films. Now, for those of you who don't know, Crocodile Dundee centers around an Australian outback adventurer named Mick Crocodile Dundee, who finds himself in various misadventures, often getting in over his head and encountering a lot of cross-culture misunderstandings and thus comedy. Good-natured bloke who sees life in simplistic ways. He manages to find love and find himself in hot water more often than not. First things first, though, let's break down the movies one piece at a time. All three Crocodile Dundee movies are centered around the previously mentioned Mick Crocodile Dundee character, played by Australian actor Paul Hogan, and Sue Charlton, played by Linda Kozlowski. Uh, other recurring characters include John Mellon as Walter Riley, Steve Rackman as Donk, the oversized, even simpler-minded drinking buddy of Mick, as well as several others. Now, the original movie came out in 1986 and managed to make quite a tidy little profit, scoring $328 million at the box office against a budget of $8.8 million. Hence why we have sequels. The basics of the story is that New York reporter Sue Charlton goes to Australia in order to interview a infamous bushman reported to have lost half a leg to a saltwater crocodile before crawling hundreds of miles to safety. Sue Charlton works for a newspaper run by her father and is currently dating the editor Richard Mason. Traveling to the small hamlet of Walkabout Creek, she eventually finds Dundee's business partner, Walter Wally Riley. And when Mick eventually turns up later that day at the pub where Wally has been entertaining her and telling her more stories about Crocodile Dundee, the man himself shows up. Turns out he has both legs but does have a nasty scar on the left leg that he refers to as a love bite revealing that the story that initially drew her here and probably through of them while he told her at the pub were highly embellished for the sake of Wally and Croc's business of carrying around carrying the occasional tourists around the outback eventually Sue realizes that while he is not the legend that has made international journalistic rumors, he is an even more fascinating and charismatic person because while he may not be borderline superhuman in his ability to survive injuries, he is a great human being, including teaching a lesson to some kangaroo poachers via the poetic justice, and a little bit of mind games. I can tell you too much because I want you to see the movie if you've never seen it. We're just giving you little nuggets. Nuggets of gold. That's what we do here. They decide to go out into the outback itself. Out to the outback. Hmm. Almost like that's why they call it the outback. You go out there. 
But they head out alone, just the two of them, to the outback so she can continue her story. Now focusing on the man behind the myths, seeing him in his natural habitat where he continues to impress her with his survival skills. And let's make no bones about this, folks. He has incredible survival skills, at least for, you know, the Australian Outback, what he's familiar with. This guy could put a lot of reality TV show hosts to shame. He knows the land. He knows how to live off of it with minimal resources. This is not a guy that carries technology around with him. Eventually... Sue invites Mick to return to her with New York City on the pretext of continuing the feature story. Although she has to admit there have been certain sparks flying between them. Upon arriving in New York, old Croc decides to wander the city on his own for a few nights. Dealing with local criminals as if they were ornery outback animals. As well as making some drinking buddies from some of the local gangs who quickly realize this is a real tough boy and as such we'd rather drink with him than pick a fight with him. Unfortunately, the aforementioned editor slash boyfriend decides to corner Sue at a party where despite having recently had a few drinks, causing him to loosen his tongue and reveal how much of a complete jerk he is, especially to Dundee and his outback lifestyle. Richard proposes to Sue in front of her friends and family, and she staggers out what sounds like a yes. Thus, a somewhat heartbroken Mick decides to slip away. And we get to the grand finale where, I uh, will go ahead and give you that spoilers, folks. The jerk boyfriend doesn't get the girl, Mick does. Although it is a close one and we get one more classic moment of Mick Dundee being the kind of man that only Mick Dundee can be. As we said, this film made huge profits and along with a couple other films from the same time period, ushered in a renewed fascination with Australia in American pop culture. So naturally, sequels were going to come about. Two years later, in 1988, we would get Crocodile Dundee 2. Now, this time it had a budget of $14 million and made $239.6 million at the box office. So yes, while it did make a profit, it was not as big a profit as the first one. You know, it happens sometimes. For the record though, it was the second highest grossing film that year for Paramount, second only to the Eddie Murphy classic, Coming to America, and was the sixth highest grossing film at the United States box office also had the biggest opening ever in the United Kingdom up to that point, including a record opening week gross for a European cinema at the Odin, Odeon Leicester Square. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Basic plot of Crocodile Dundee 2 is that Mick has continued to reside in New York with Sue Although he still has not quite adapted to the general culture, still trying to do things like he would in the outback, such as blast fishing, or dynamite fishing as it's sometimes called, in Manhattan's waters. He's also become even more infamously known around town, thanks to Sue's story having seen print since the end of the first movie, quickly becoming somewhat of a local celebrity, which helps him out because 
Hey, everybody wants to be his friend, and Mick just wants to be friends with everybody. Eventually, uh, things go bad, though. You see, in the first movie, Sue had mentioned in passing having an ex-husband named Bob. In the second movie, Bob is shown, specifically a being a reporter working in South America, trying to expose a Colombian drug cartel. He gets highly incriminating photos and sends them off to Sue before the drug cartel captures him. Fortunately, they interrogate him before murdering him and two of the cartel's leaders head to New York City to get the photos from Sue, which they do with a lot of shooting and taking hostage of Sue Charlton. McDundee does not put up with this and after a comedically action-filled sequence, manages to rescue Sue and more importantly, makes the decision to take her back to the Outback. It is again such wonderfully flowing words. We're going back to the outback. Out to the outback. Perfectly named the piece of geography. The outback. But yes, folks. We return to Australia where it all began in the first movie. Where utilizing his great understanding of the geography Mick begins a guerrilla warfare one man campaign against the drug cartel and the local thugs they have hired in the process though he also reveals to Sue that he actually owns by what American standards would be a fairly large sized plot of land that includes a gold mine, which means, even though he'd have to liquidate a lot of stuff first, he is technically rich. But as he puts it, he doesn't care. He can't eat money and doesn't make him happy to have a ton of it. So he just hangs out on his land. Points out it's not much good for farming, not much good for raising a lot of things. Just a chunk of swamp. Sure, there might be some gold on there, but who really wants to go digging for gold? That doesn't sound fun. Still, things build to a massive conclusion as the drug cartel and Mick compete to see who will win the day. Mick calls on some old friends, including some aborigines, to help him set his traps and ambushes, leading to more wonderfully funny moments involving not just different cultures, but specifically expectations due to Hollywood stereotypes versus reality. Yep, these aborigines might know a little bit more about modern culture than some people think they do. Hint, hint. Still, while an incredibly funny movie, as we've said before, it financially was not as successful as its predecessor, and the fact that Paul Hogan was not exactly the youngest of young men when the filming on the first movie began, we had to wait quite a while for a third movie in the sequence. How long did we have to wait? Well, we had to wait until 2001. 13 years. Yep, that means Paul Hogan's even older, but hey, he's still got that young energy at heart. Real quick, the movie is considered uh, to be a failure due to the fact that it had a budget of $25 million and only grossed $39.4 million at the box office. And as such, it is pretty much um, most likely going to be the end of the series between the age 
the age of Paul Hogan and the lackluster performance of the third movie. Still, it is not a horrible movie. The basic plot sees Mick Dundee living in Australia with Sue Charlton and their young son, Mikey, aka Michael Dundee Jr., with croc hunting having been made illegal, Mick is reduced to wrestling crocodiles for the entertainment of tourists. A lot, and as such, finds himself occasionally having trouble adapting to the 21st century. Still, he does not have trouble have trouble adapting to fatherhood, has a great relationship with his son. Everyone sues father calls upon her to help, specifically at a newspaper in Los Angeles. All three of them head to America. Mick feeling that this would be a great chance for their son to see the culture and society that his mother grew up in and make him a more intelligent, well-rounded person. It's actually great logic. I fully support this. Anytime anybody has a chance to, in a controlled environment... As opposed to just like slumming it around the country, you know, another country. Visiting other cultures is always a plus. First-hand interaction with locals is the best way to get a sense for how another country, society, culture, whichever you want to call it, functions on a day-to-day basis. And thus is the best learning experience. So again, great father, Mick. Great father. Upon arriving in L.A., though, Mick is up to his old troubles, and the crocodile continues to have cross-cultural mishaps, along with new buddy Jacko, who eventually follows behind to hang with Mick and the rest of the Dundee family. The main story plot, though, concerns the fact that Mick finds himself stumbling onto a job working on a film set that he suspects is being used as a front to smuggle paintings in and out of the country. This leads to Mick trying to play amateur detective mostly based off what he has learned from watching detective shows on TV. And we all know how 100% accurate police procedural shows are compared to real-life police work. Okay, now that we're all done laughing, because let's remember, this is a comedy, and that's the point. To laugh. Do it all, though. Mick, Jacko, and even Mick Jr. to an extent there, a.k.a. Mikey, managed to save the day, and even for a brief moment there, save Sue in a wonderful little callback to the old days, before finally doing what, frankly, we all suspected Dundee should have done after the first movie. And that is officially, formally, legally, Mary Sue. Yep, that's right. While it may be the last movie in the series, we ended on a wonderful note where Mick Dundee finally gets married to Sue after they journey back to Australia and their regular lives. Movie ending with Mick contemplating hanging up his famous crocodile Dundee hat and then deciding you know what still a little bit of the Outback boy in me after all so where do we lie on these movies first one highly recommended anybody who enjoys these kind of action comedy, especially the cross-cultural comedy type stuff, will find this movie wonderful. Paul Hogan may not be the greatest actor in the world, but he 
even in the first movie, had a perfect grasp on who Mick Dundee needed to be and plays the character so believably that, well, frankly, to 90% of the world, Paul Hogan is Mick Dundee. Fell into that classic Hollywood trap of playing a character so good that nobody can picture him being anything else. Now it is true, in a wrap up, real quick I'm going to say this before we get on to the uh, recommendations on sequels. Yes, Paul Hogan has played Mick Dundee in various commercials, especially in, his, in Australia. As, you know, and a few that made it to America. In, including a kind of meta fourth wall type comedy in which he plays a fictionalized version of himself whose personality tends to mix a bit with Mick Dundee's uh, discussing dusting himself off in time to be honored with knighthood. I haven't seen that particular film yet, but I'm just throwing it out there as part of the technical ongoing Crocodile Dundee legacy. But we are focusing on the official movie trilogy. Second movie... Hey, I personally enjoy it. I can agree with a lot of people. It doesn't have quite as many iconic moments as the first movie, but it is a highly worthy follow-up. And by inverting the formula of starting in Australia and ending in New York with starting in New York and ending with Australia, it does bring the two classic and filmed relatively close together movies into a nice little full circle story plot. So, if you go ahead and see the first Crocodile Dundee movie, if afterwards you feel like you just haven't gotten enough of old Mick, by all means see the second one. I have a feeling you will highly enjoy it. As for the third movie, it's not an unwatchable movie. It is a step down noticeably from the first two, but it is not a horrible movie. Trust me, I can name several movies that I would refuse to watch if I had a choice between them and Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. The movie is a bit camp. Some of the humor can feel a bit dated for something made in 2001, but it still has at its core a lot of that Dundee charm. And so, hey, for the sake of completion, if you get this far, go ahead and see it. If nothing else, it's the kind of movie you can enjoy with a friend, making fun of, and laughing along with it. So, that's my recommendations. Definitely see the first one. Second one. And unless you just completely find the first one boring, see it. Third one. When you're in the mood for something a little camp, a little cheesy, go ahead and knock it out and say you've seen the whole trilogy. Is there anything in the future for it? Well, as I said, Paul Hogan is definitely getting a little too old to be jumping around and playing with even animatronic crocodiles. Could we see a reboot slash remake? Well, Hollywood's bound to do anything, but hopefully they'll leave this one well enough alone. Maybe a four, focusing on his now grown up son. Eh, it'd be a little more tolerable, but I just don't know if anybody could compete with that Paul Hogan charm. Yeah, the guy really is naturally charismatic about a, a, a lot of this stuff and that character. I just can't picture a lot of people who could compete with that. It was a perfect character for his time. 
Still, as long as these films stay available on streaming services, showing up on classic cable television, as long as it stays around, I'm going to be sad my, to see that crash in my lifetime. Or, for those of you like me who do enjoy a little bit of physical media, as long as they continue to show up on DVD slash Blu-ray slash whatever else they come up with in the future, because they are old enough to have technically started on VHS, it's all good. Grab them if you can find them. For now, though, we are done rambling for one week. We'll see you in seven. And every Friday after, because you hear that? It's coming. We're only a few months away from episode 200 of The Ramblings. That's right. The march to 200 continues. We'll have to do something awesome for that. Check it out, and check out every episode. We have a wonderful archive that you can find if you subscribe to this channel. And if you have any suggestions, feel free to throw them my way. Just remember, we are here to entertain. We're here to enjoy. We're not here to throw raging hatred. If you want that, with all due respect, there are plenty of other YouTube channels that review movies in that fashion. Enjoy them, and come back to enjoy us. Bye-bye, folks.